thanks everyone for for joining. Um, very excited to have you all here, um, and also thank you, Adam, for for joining us. Uh, really appreciate it. My uh, pleasure, and um, uh, thanks to all the organizers and the people behind this community. It's something that um, I kind of strive to do my part to kind of build and maintain the alumni entrepreneurship and tech community. Uh, so delighted to participate in that and uh, meet you all. Yeah, I mean, I think likewise, uh, we, we are uh, very excited to push this forward, both uh, me and Adam, and, and I think all the other uh, alums out there. So please feel free to reach out to us uh, anytime. Um, you know, I think what, maybe I'll, I'll start off with, uh, you know, how, how I got to know Adam. So I've gotten to know him over the past year, actually, um, mainly as an angel investor and advisor to the early stage startups um, in the Bold Start portfolio that I've been uh, fortunate enough to work with. And he has been a massive help to all those founders. Uh, they, they get on, you know, call it 30 minute, one hour calls with him and come out uh, with a whole new refreshed look on go to market uh, and product strategy and a number of other items. So could not be more excited to share his insights with all of you today. Um, maybe first off, I'll just introduce myself. Uh, I'm Sean McGosh, a CMU alum, class of uh, 2012, uh, currently a principal at Bold Start Ventures, and we're a seed stage VC fund that partners with technical founders who are innovating in the enterprise software space, uh, and we're kind of a day one partner for them. So we've been fortunate to partner with great companies from the beginning, like Sneak, Customer, Big ID, uh, Superhuman, Security Scorecard, and many more. Um, and I can't even read the full uh, resume for, for Adam, um, but he is uh, an alum from, from the class of 1994. Uh, he's the former CEO of Heroku, which was acquired by Salesforce for $212 million in 2010. Um, and before that, Adam actually co-founded Cloud Connect, which was acquired into Heroku. He was uh, the SVP of sales and marketing, and then also the SVP of uh, uh, developer marketing at Salesforce and Dropbox for that uh, and finally started his career co-founding Personify. So needless to say, he's done it all in the world of enterprise software and we're, we're, we're gonna learn a lot from him today. Um, we'll dive into a conversation for the first kind of, uh, uh, you know, let's say 30 minutes here. Um, and then with the remaining time, I think Sl Slideo, um, uh, please just put your questions in there and then um, you know, those will be sent to, to me by, by chat for, for me to ask Adam. Um, so with that, let me, let me just start, kick it off. Uh, so Adam, you know, can you describe what it was like starting a company out of college? I mean, um, you know, starting Personify just straight from college, I imagine that must have been a big leap. So what, what made you do that? What was the experience like? And, and can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, I actually, uh, I, I got on a plane um, three weeks after I graduated, oh, so many years ago in 94, and uh, took a job at, at Stanford Research Institute and was there for, um, about 18 months before I started my, my first company, Personify, uh, late 95, early 96. And, um, you know, I have to say, I obviously I was eager to do it, uh, and it was an amazing experience. I'm not entirely sure I would recommend it. Um, it would be hard to state how little I knew and um, how difficult a process it is learning all the things uh, along the way. I guess maybe that's a little bit of a contrarian point of view. I know that, you know, the archetypes we like to hold up are the people that um, leave like three days after their freshman year and go on and achieve um, incredible success. Um, maybe those people are luckier or smarter than I am. Um, but um, uh, it, it, it was a journey. It, um, I, I, I'm gen, you know, it probably has something to do with the space that you're in. My, when we started Personify, I don't know that we knew what it was going to be. Um, it ended up being an enterprise software company. Um, you know, maybe if we were doing something, being an enterprise software company in the 90s uh, was a particularly painful business. And um, uh, so many things that, you know, you just kind of have to learn um, uh, on the ground. It's easier to be an enterprise software company today. It's easier to be a startup today. Why is this whole speech sounding like I'm just an old man? Um, you know, at the time, you know, there, there wasn't Y Combinator. There wasn't, you know, these textbooks on, on kind of, there weren't entrepreneurship programs. So uh, uh, it, it was definitely a challenge. But I guess my, my larger point is um, certainly rewarding and uh, 
uh, genuinely nothing like it. Um, but depending on what you're going into, doing a stint at a couple places to see kind of just even the basics of how you ship software and kind of get things done is, uh, is not necessarily a bad idea. And um, I'll close with, well, I remember, I'll close with a funny story I, or what I thought was funny. I remember uh, some years later when I was at Salesforce, I'm kind of walking around the floor and I see a woman in a, in a CMU vest and I'm like, oh, you went to CMU? That's great, I did too, you know? Oh yeah, when did you graduate? And she's like, oh, I graduated, you know, a year ago. And I'm like, what are you doing here? You've got the rest of your life to be in this office. Like go become a ski bum for a while. So uh, maybe not the right message for the entrepreneurial group, but um, uh, there's a lot of time to, to do startups. I started my second one, um, you know, a good uh, 18 years later. Um, partly as a reaction, because I, I kind of felt like I wanted to do it once I actually knew some things. Um, so uh, uh, nothing wrong with kind of building some skills along the way. Yeah, and, and you know, that's something that I think resonates a lot with uh, me as, as, a, as an investor, right, is a lot of the companies, or a lot of the, 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 the founders that we partner with, um, it's really trying to, do, do they have a pain that they've lived, right? And are they solving that pain? And, and it's really hard to get that pain unless you've actually worked in, in industry. Yeah, right? um, and so, uh, so that's something I think makes a ton of sense and, and, and really appreciate you sharing that because it, it kind of takes away from this myth that it does sometimes happen, but in enterprise software, uh, a little less likely for people just kind of straight um, going without any industry experience and, and then starting a company, but it certainly can happen. Um, you, you were at Salesforce actually, you know, kind of fair, fairly early in the company's journey. And that's just such an amazing company, right? Kind of evangelizing the SaaS space, evangelizing the cloud delivery model and the financial uh, model as well. You know, what, what was it like working at um, that company at the time with, you know, Oracle on one side uh, and, then, and then this whole new kind of method that Salesforce was trying to get across, especially if you were leading kind of sales and marketing. What, what did that look like? Yeah, I, uh, you know, kind of, following from my startup experience, we, we were an on-prem kind of big enterprise software company because that's all that really existed back then. And one of the lessons I took from that was I never wanted to do on-prem again. It was just so painful. It was so hard to get the customer successful. It was kind of so much work and effort. And so this was around 2000, 2001, um, when kind of Salesforce started popping up. I ended up joining uh, in early 2003. Um, there were only about 20 of us in all of product and development. So uh, obviously it was pretty early uh, in the game. And um, uh, I mean, what an, uh, what an amazing experience to, uh, to, to place to grow and learn and uh, be part of a rocket ship. I, 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 prob I learned more there probably than doing my first startup or um, at least took, uh, took better lessons from that. Um, I'm trying to think, you know, there, there's so many things that we take for granted, I think, in the current SaaS ecosystem that were developed in early days of Salesforce. And uh, maybe um, a couple really, really big lessons that I pulled out of there. Um, one was, and this is no, uh, this is recognizable to anybody who's spent any time anywhere near Salesforce, is the importance of doing marketing really right and kind of doing that really well and kind of learning how to do that. It's a little bit mysterious, but. Um, uh, having the experience to, uh, to, to do marketing in that setting was amazing. And, you know, I remember in the early days, and, you know, this is all credit to a lot of the early people and obviously Mark, the, the founder and CEO, co-founder and CEO, um, marketing there was run like a political campaign in the sense of like, it was rapid response. It was always looking for, um, uh, uh, you know, opportunities to deliver the message. It was creative. It was emotive. Um, which was everything that enterprise software wasn't at the time. And, you know, was an important lesson in don't try and emulate the models before, you know, obviously we were inventing an entirely new kind of application model, but it really was an entirely new kind of enterprise software model. Um, even something as subtle as if you think about the uh, Salesforce brand and we think about kind of enterprise software brands prior to that, at least those of us who were acquainted with them, you know, and a lot of them today, they were dry, they were boring, right? They were stuffy. That was kind of how they had to be, you know, presented as authoritative and important. And here was Salesforce, this company that, you know, had three sticks to rub together. And it decided it was going to have a very emotive brand. It was going to have a, 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 
idea of fun as the brand was kind of very explicit and, and baked in early on. Um, and that was very different. And uh, the final, I guess maybe one kind of last point here, something that um, I was lucky to be a part of there that has certainly kind of informed how I look about things and look at things now is, you know, all of us as entrepreneurs think about technology trends, we think about product trends, we think about kind of what's changing in uh, consumer behavior. Um, and then we tend to have these kind of, you know, questions about go to market that are, you know, well, that's something I'll kind of work out once I get all this important new innovative stuff over here. And for me, one of the big lessons I took from Salesforce was how important it is to innovate, go to market along with all the other things. And the companies I think that really are uh, the most innovative and most successful are the ones that can kind of fuse go to market uh, innovation and prioritize go to market innovation with the same kind of you know, gusto as they do product innovation and kind of and technology innovation and all the other things. Um, you know, the idea of signing up, things that we take just so for granted today idea of being able to sign up and get a trial, right? That didn't exist before. That was entirely a function of the cloud model. What did that mean? It meant that you could um, uh, do a Google ad, which was also new then, and get a customer and get them to sign up for a thing and get them to experience something, which was a radically different, uh, obviously, approach than enterprise software work before. So uh, maybe the kind of quick early lesson, and frankly, probably how Salesforce won, is it was existing in an entirely different context. Not just the fact that it was on demand that, or, or SaaS, that was obviously kind of the, 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 the foundational thing, but with a different go-to-market model, with a different kind of marketing style and message, and really the combination of exploiting all of those things, each one of those differences was harder and harder for any of our competitors uh, 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 to copy or to exploit and or even pay attention to it to think of more important. And that really, I think, created a, a lot of the path that we were able to execute on. Was, was it a, a active decision to uh, like the, the marketing at least, and, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, is, um, I may be, but you know, the, what we hear are the stories like the big signs that say death to Oracle or death to software. And then, you know, the, the, the other thing that we heard about is like, uh, I think there was like a party across from a big Oracle conference, right? That then a bunch of users went to, or at least that's the folklore. But like, um, wh what I'm curious about is it, it sounds like kind of aggressive marketing tactics, like right? very, uh, you know, in your face, boisterous, kind of getting out there in a big way. Was that something that, you know, continued um, throughout the, the the company's history that you were there? Like, was that a, a specific thing that you said, hey, we're going to do this because of the players that are currently in the space? Or, what, or, or was that just kind of more based off of the, the founders? You know, company behavior, um, at least at that level, tends to be kind of intentional and explicit. And that was certainly true of Salesforce. I mean, it was that way because um, Mark and others kind of created that culture. And I'll say that the message was no software. It wasn't debts to software. Debts to software would be a little grim. Um, I, I did a presentation a while ago on this topic uh, for heavy bit. You can Google it and find it. But um, one of the takeaways there is, you know, and, and what was so important to the marketing and something I counsel startups on now is they think about their message right, is Salesforce at the time, there were a hundred, if not a thousand online contact, contact, contact managers. It was not that there was, this was the only kind of game in town, right? But um, uh, Salesforce obviously won and it won uh, partly through uh, marketing. And at the core of that marketing was, um, we had a real industry transformation message, right? The message of Salesforce wasn't, here's a contact manager. The message of Salesforce was, here's an entirely new model, an entirely new way of, uh, of, of using or thinking about applications and software that was going to promise radically different benefits. So the fact that it, the message was no software was an industry message, right? We didn't say better CRM contacts or better contact management or easier access to phone numbers. The message was, we have an industry message. And that message itself is something that's going to be much more compelling for the press to talk about. It's going to be much more interesting to, uh, for people to think about. Obviously, you still have to have kind of a clear tactical value proposition. But um, uh, I always advise folks to be thinking actively, you know, what is your industry transformation message? And it, it, it will help elevate you. It'll help elevate the discussion with your customers. Uh, and ultimately, hopefully, help you stand apart. One one of the things I want to get back to actually is, is um, so you know, 
within your career, uh, you, you had this amazing career at, at Salesforce and Dropbox, but then you, you know, as you mentioned earlier on, um, kind of made that decision to start a company again, right? And, uh, and that's a hard decision because I imagine at that time, you're used to a fairly, you know, decent sized salary, you're used to compensation, things like that, and you have a lifestyle. So kind of talk through what went through your mind starting that company. Why did you, why did you start Cloud Connect? What, what drove you to do that? What was the decision process as you were thinking about uh, making that journey? Yeah, it's funny. I think there are a couple of things. One is, you know, don't underestimate how um, exhausting it can be being in a big company for a long time. And by the time I left Salesforce, it was a big company. And, you know, at some point you're just like all organizations, you're just managing um, kind of internal stuff. You're further and further away from <clears throat> what's innovative and what's new and what's happening and kind of being able to build stuff. And that just kind of is what it is. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, and I, I hope this is the case for those of you that are kind of thinking about this, it was an itch that I just had to scratch. You know, I would go and talk to um, uh, early stage companies about joining, or I talked to people about different job opportunities. And I kept trying to pitch them on what I was thinking about and I wanted to do. And pretty quickly realized that, uh, uh, you know, how much I was committed to it and the size of the itch um, that I should just give a shot uh, at scratching it. And, you know, partly of that was informed by my early experience where I knew so little. And, uh, you know, at this point, so many years later and with so much experience um, uh, being part of scaling, uh, you know, a bunch of different companies, I was like, you know, I really got to get another at bat and see what happens. Um, and uh, the punchline is it's just hard in a whole different set of ways. It was not like it, it didn't come easy. So um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I did it. Um, and it was an amazing experience. Um, and, and certainly, but I just had a whole different set of lessons uh, as a result of it. it and what's interesting about Cloud Connect is, uh, if I have my research correct, uh, it was it was then acquired by Heroku, and then you went on to become the, the CEO of Heroku, in fact. Um, and so I'm curious on how that process evolved, right? Because uh, you know normally you have an acquisition that that leader is is promoted to the executive leadership team, but but usually not the uh, or, or not always the, the CEO, right? So I'm curious on how, how that came about, and um, and what was that feeling to you? Like, what, how did it feel like to say, okay, well now. I'm in this larger company and now I'm going to be leading this. Like what, what, what was going through your mind? Yeah. Um, I mean, mostly I was really lucky, you know, when you sell your company, um, you kind of are handing your fate over to a whole bunch of other things. The whole idea, obviously of having your startup is you're in control and you make that decision and it may work out. It may not. And there's generally no harm, no foul if it doesn't. So to have the experience that I had kind of post acquisition, and um, to, to all the learning and growth I got, to all the fun I had, that was an enormous um, experience that I'm really grateful for. Uh, in that particular case, uh, there was a, a, a gentleman running Heroku, amazing, amazing guy, uh, Todd Nielsen. He had gone on to a different job. And so um, at that point, I was running a decent chunk of the organization. I had marketing, engineering, um, and product. And so uh, it was just kind of a natural uh, succession. Um, but uh, the, the larger, you know, what I learned at Heroku and kind of the larger experience of transforming a culture um, from uh, one that was, you know, kind of in the founder led mode that was a little more ad hoc, that was more dependent on kind of having a strong kind of founder leader and those guys, which were amazing, amazing people. Uh, but at that point they had left for, by the time I joined, um, they were gone uh, about 18 months and kind of transforming the organization into one that was um, a little more team oriented, a little uh, more collaborative and frankly capable of kind of planning and orienting itself towards bigger and larger things. The really kind of big cultural thing that I think we experienced at Heroku, which wasn't unique for developer facing companies at the time um, was, and this relates to the, today's topic of PLG was especially a couple of years ago, it's fortunately a little less the case now, you know, the, the general idea was if you were successful with, uh, you know, doing a product for individuals, in this case for individual developers, but you can imagine for kind of individuals in any capacity, the idea that you would then do enterprise was viewed as entirely antithetical to that. Uh, enterprise uh, in Heroku in 2013 
was a four letter word with an exclamation mark at the end of it. It was 100, you know, how could you possibly build something that was gonna be so empathetic and carefully crafted, which it was, for the needs of uh, individual developers and that being kind of the core and heart of your culture, and then start engaging in all this enterpriseness, you know, the canonical model, which is, you know, two salespeople uh, at a golf course deciding that's going to be the purchase, right? You know, just totally different things. And the, the foundation of what we did, at least in kind of my chapter of Heroku was uh, with the help of a lot of really great people was really just help get everybody on board with the idea that these weren't um, uh, competitive forces, but in fact, they were complementary. And that's a cultural transformation more than it is anything else, you know, getting people on board and aligned with that, um, that this is how we're going to be kind of focusing things. And it's going to be okay in that uh, we can serve developers kind of across the spectrum and achieve uh, 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 all kinds of new innovation and ultimately apply the same kind of thoughtfulness and empathy that made our product so good for individual developers to being the most thoughtful uh, uh, and empathetic um, product people for developers and enterprise contexts was in fact entirely congruent. And that's, that's what we did. And that's really what um, was responsible for a lot of the growth. Yeah, the, it's, uh, you know, what's amazing is Heroku for, for developers is still something that uh, gets talked about, frankly, in, in all the founder circles, right? Because everyone's trying to build that, that sort of developer experience. And what's really interesting is that, uh, Salesforce is, is not talked about like that, uh, to, to be frank. And so what's, what's kind of an interesting uh, thing that I'd love to dive into is, you know, you, you're now the CEO of Heroku. It's, it's, things are going well. You have this great, you know, self-serve developer motion. Uh, people are loving the product. And then Salesforce, presumably, or, or, you know, somehow comes knocking on your door and says, hey, we'd like to buy the company. Um, you know, at that point, you have two very different, or maybe maybe not, but I think there are some different cultures, and one that is a very top-down, um, of course, sales and marketing, enterprise-driven uh, sort of organization, Salesforce, and then one that's much more developer and user-driven and product-driven in Heroku. So, I, I mean, did you have any kind of concerns that that culture would be stopped or changed in some way, and, and how'd you go about thinking about that acquisition? Yeah, for sure. and. Um... You know, it's really a story of how Salesforce uh, manages acquisitions and how that's changed as much as it is a story uh, of Heroku. But um, for most of Heroku's existence and up until largely when I left, which was 2018, Heroku was an entirely independent entity. So, you know, we did share, we shared things like legal. We had, um, uh, uh, we obviously sold through the Heroku, uh, the Salesforce channel, although it wasn't the most important channel for us. Um, but the attitude was, you know, kind of let us be. And, you know, one of our missions or kind of even explicit goals in the management team was make the Heroku bi business big enough that kind of Salesforce had to care. Otherwise, it could have been, you know, written off or squashed at any time. Um, that said, so uh, Heroku now is uh, an integrated part of the Salesforce business. It is no longer a distinct company. Um, and uh, the vitality of the self-serve part of the business, um, I think is it's reasonable to question. Um, you know, or organizations at that scale and kind of the way they operate, as somebody who obviously has kind of a self-serve and, and bottoms up orientation, um, that can be a bit of a lonely business inside of an organization like Salesforce. I, I, it's, it's really hard when you have so much of the organization oriented now, it wasn't always the case, but now to much more traditional, very large enterprise selling um, to get people to understand uh, and care. And I'm sympathetic to that. You know, the organizations have a hard time understanding that. But um, yeah, I don't think Salesforce understands product like growth. Uh, they they have new people there that weren't there when I was there. People like Stuart who started Slack, <clears throat> who has a similar motion. I'd be fascinated. You know, maybe that will help um, inform things. Uh, obviously, I think it's important not only um, because of the go-to-market efficiencies it can drive, but it re it requires a certain product discipline. And um, 
one of the kind of anti patterns as you go further up enterprise is you you know end up having um, serving just the largest customers who are the most vocal by definition are signing the largest deals. And frankly, I think that's probably the skew that you've seen over the past however many years in the Salesforce core product itself is it's lost a little bit of the focus on um, on kind of serving everybody else. And very challenging to do both, uh, empathetic to those challenges, but um, I think both sides of the business would benefit from having that be more balanced. Yeah, we, we, we started to um, talk about right there, but I'd love to dive into more of the the go-to-market differences that we're, we're kind of exploring here. So, you know, on the one hand, Salesforce, uh, I mean, one of the most fascinating distribution models that has been constructed over time in terms of the channel partnerships, the direct sales force, the, the marketing engine, I mean, just remarkable, but all very top-down CIO, CTO, uh, uh, executive level uh, decision makers. Um, then you had, you know, Dropbox, which you're at, which was more end user adopted, right? Um, but that end user could have been, you know, a business user or could have been, uh, you know, my mom, right? Any, anybody could have adopted that. And then Heroku, which is much more, you know, kind of developer first uh, as a persona. So how can, how do you think about the differences between that? I'm, I'm, it's, it's, it's interesting. And can you actually, I think it'd be really interesting to talk about, you know, a PLG model for Dropbox can actually be very different than a PLG model for Heroku. So if you could kind of compare and contrast it, I think that'd be pretty interesting. Yeah, and I'll add a couple, you know, maybe anecdotes in there. There was a time in the very, very early Salesforce history when they had some of that kind of enterprise phobia too. Now that quickly, um, so Salesforce didn't start big enterprise the way we associate it now. In fact, right, what they really built was kind of that core uh, Teams motion where they were selling to, um, uh, uh, you know, a department leader or even a team leader, and then the seed and grow motion, right, which they really kind of invented. And that was their, I think, Salesforce's uh, real kind of contribution uh, to the larger kind of go-to-market puzzle, which is still a dominant model today. And then over time, kind of layered in more traditional enterprise. And over time, I think that became um, more and more kind of dominant in its culture. Um, you know, one of the things I talk to founders and startups uh, uh, about a lot. And it's, I guess, back to that early, earlier point of, you know, for me, the business has to be holistic and intentional. Meaning, you know, again, thinking about your go-to-market as an integral part of your product and hopefully an innovative part of your product and not just something that, oh, I have a product, how am I thinking about maybe, um, uh, again, throwing it over the wall to a bunch of salespeople, right? That model isn't gonna work. and I think you see organizations that have uh, kind of a high intentionality uh, that do it well, and they have organizations that have kind of a low intentionality and uh, don't do it as well. And, you know, as I like to say about Dropbox, I was the first of many people to unsuccessfully yoke them to the enterprise. And, you know, it's up to them how they want to kind of steer the business. They did a major turn towards consumer, right? And they bought the photo products and the mail products, stuff like that. Um, you know, you're looking at Facebook and you're like, hey, that looks like a pretty attractive place to be. Uh, and, you know, that, that, that kind of shows, right? It's gonna, you're not going to pursue enterprise. You're not going to build a PLG if that's what your, your, your strategy is. So uh, I think they've probably maybe adjusted, uh, adjusted that. So um, maybe the answer there is it, it really kind of comes from the top. It really has to be something that's intentional um, it's uh, uh, not something that you kind of experiment or dabble with in the sense of like, hey, we'll just, you know, take three people over here and try and do a self-serve thing if we're an enterprise company. I talk to companies all the time that are traditional enterprise sales that are trying to build these other motions. And the ones that work are when the CEO is like, you know, burn the ships, we're going in, right? And the ones that don't are, we're, let's experiment here. And of course, then it's never going to uh, amount to anything. Yeah, it, it, you know, it's it's interesting because um, uh, I think talking a little bit more about that model, it, it's, you know, what, even though we talk about self-serve and we talk about developer first or end user adopted, um, in the end, like now it's it's sort of weirdly become this dirty word of fee, field sales, but it's still, there's still a bunch of field sales that are that, that come into these models, right, and are quite successful. I mean, what's powering Twilio, what powered Slack uh, before the acquisition, is actually people going out into the field and doing those sort of traditional relationship sales. Um, so 
how, how should people on this call kind of think about that sort of, it, it almost seems like it's incongruous, right? Like, hey, it's product led, so I should just be, it should just be selling itself and people use it and buy more and, and so on and so forth. Um, but then you still have these, these field sales teams that are quite successful. So kind of, can you talk a little bit about how those live together and, and, and why those work uh, in concert with each other? Yeah, I, I have a whole longer presentation, not that much longer, I've done on this topic. If you Google Adam Gross heavy bit self-serve something, you'll find it if people want to kind of get the whole spiel. Um, but the short version is they're kind of, they're basically, uh, uh, you know, three modes of selling, right? And that have kind of accreted over time, right? There's the, uh, as I referenced before, you know, at the golf course with Gucci shoes, that's the one that we all um, intrinsically reject because it has nothing to do with the value of the product. It's just the, you know, quality of the drinks at the country club, um, right? That's kind of the one dot article. That, that's again, like canonically what we think about like Oracle nineties kind of sales, right? 2.0 was kind of the SaaS um, a trial team motion that Salesforce really developed. And then 3.0 is that uh, uh, in, selling to the individual first motion, sometimes free, sometimes paid, and then kind of converting them up there. The thing to understand, I guess, is, or the, the way that I think about it is um, for PLG companies in their kind of full bloom, it's not that they're just doing self-serve, it's that they're doing all three. That you start with the individual, then you add, if you start, maybe let's call that the Dropbox model, then you layer in the Salesforce model, and then you layer in the Oracle model, right? And you have all three working together. And the trick is, if you are moving your customers along in that funnel in that journey, it's going to be um, much, uh, much cheaper to make the sale, much more effective, and much more kind of value oriented, because you're kind of demonstrating value uh, to the customer the whole way versus just kind of going for that one big top down sale. Um, two of the really important tricks there are, and kind of the conversations I have a lot with startups are, um, when do you kind of engage in the success of motions? And my broader kind of name for this is Goldilocks go to market, because the question usually I end, the discussions I end up usually having are, you know, um, when, right? Not if, but when. And it's a tricky question. And I see companies all the time uh, having to make really hard call, calls because it's like, oh, here's, you know, a deal for $200 million or maybe not that big, but, you know, okay, 200K um, that for some big enterprise, but can we support them? Should we do that? Should we build that thing, right? Even if you're just still trying to uh, kind of build your, your initial self-serve motion, uh, that's the first thing. Um, the second is, and this is kind of my general theory about the future of software marketing or technology marketing is it's hard enough for companies to be good at one kind of marketing, to be good at sales 1.0, it's hard enough for them to be good at, it's really, really hard for them to be good at sales 2.0. And the reality is I think for most uh, startups and most organizations in the future, you're gonna have to be good at all three. You're gonna have to have a kind of a multimodal marketing organization and go-to-market organization or just even go-to-market structure. And given how hard it is for organizations to align to do anything, to get an organization to be able to do all three of those things and keep it all straight and not have everybody run on everybody's toes and have the salespeople like WTFing the people over here because why are you working on, you know, why is that free? You know, what the hell are you doing? You know, what, what are the, you know, getting that straight, keeping everybody aligned, um, that is the really, really hard thing to do. And I think about what did we really accomplish at Heroku most successfully uh, that I'm most proud of? It was that organization that we had the right kind of cross-organizational collaboration, that we had mechanisms for keeping each other kind of aligned. And it allowed us to do this very intentional and deliberate kind of march to the enterprise with a brilliant product, with brilliant salespeople, with brilliant marketing. And it was gangbusters. When I started, um, you know, our business was 95% online and 5% enterprise. And when I left, it was 50-50 which is exactly where you want it to be with a vital growing online self-serve segment that instead of just them saying at some point, oh, we tapped out, we can, you know, there's nothing else we can do here, then being able to migrate to an enterprise product, we went from deal sizes that were topping out at 150, 200K to you know, doing $7 million deals. But the whole time having the right culture and the right processes to say, it's still really important that we build a feature uh, that's just about free developer adoption. It's 
incredibly important. And those things weren't getting buried and that we were kind of, you know, able to kind of keep all those things straight. I think um, someone may be uh, typing, so if you don't mind uh, going on mute, that would be, that would be helpful. Um, two, more, two more questions from me, Adam, and then I think we have, we have a number of uh, uh, great questions queued up from the audience. Um, you, you talked about the, the culture in uh, just, just right now, but I mean, it just seems like that's such a tough thing because you have different incentives. You have different people that you're hiring at, at different stages to manage those three uh, kind of phase shifts that you, or not even phase shifts, three states that you, you mentioned. Um, you know, I, I, obviously this is a much longer, uh, uh, it will require probably a much longer answer, but, but just talking, talk through like, how were you able to set up the culture to be able to incorporate all of those different things, right? Because even in some cases, like, how does product know whose feedback to, uh, to, you know, value the most? Or how does sales know what lead that they should follow, whether they, you know, the field sales lead or the inside sales lead that just came up from, you know, usage, like, I, how, how do you, how did you deal with that culture? I'll, I'll try and boil that down maybe to one tactical anecdote that is kind of helpful for people um, and, and maybe in their own situations, uh, but certainly not comprehensive. Um, one thing I learned from Mark and Salesforce is the importance of internal communication, the importance of communicating with your peers, with your managers, with your, your team, with your staff. And when we think about communication, I think there's one frame where you think about it as a tax, where it's like, you know, I got to explain myself over again, or I got to build this deck, you know, why am I spending all this time on, you know, having to clarify this thing or people aren't getting aligned, you know, why am I having to explain myself four times? And, and one of the things that was helpful about my Salesforce experience was understanding that, you know, the higher you go in the organization, the more percentage of your time should be spent on that. And that it's not a tax, it is absolutely core. You know, if I was spending 30, 40% of my total time just communicating back to the organization, that was kind of okay. That was standard. That was okay. That was the expectation. I should have, I should be doing that much. So um, I say that uh, because when it comes to kind of setting attention and alignment and just getting organizations to be functional. Certainly it's benefited me. I'm lucky to have kind of native PowerPoint skills and enjoy communicating in general. Um, uh, I think written communication is hugely important. You know, there's kind of the Amazon memo culture. All of those things, uh, when faced with those opportunities, if, ever, if it ever feels like busy work and like, why am I doing this? Try and take the opportunity to, to kind of build those skills because uh, those were essential for um, the kind of transformation that we went under, uh, that, that we went through. Um, uh, you know, I, I often joke, people are probably maybe be familiar with Dreamforce, which is like the big um, uh, Salesforce conference or, you know, how much energy Mark focuses on marketing. One of the things I learned kind of along the way was like, oh, we're not doing this as we got bigger. We're not going through all this just to communicate to our customers. We're doing this to communicate back to the organization. Internal communication and alignment was so important that, you know, I mean, major marketing efforts through PR just to kind of reflect and communicate back to the organization. So um, a big topic, but maybe a, a helpful uh, anecdote there. That is, that is fascinating. It's something actually I, I haven't considered. So that, that's, that's really interesting to hear that Salesforce was taking that approach. Um, you know, my final question for me before we get to the audience uh, Q and A is um, I think one of the, the hardest things with product led growth models is you have this thing where an end user is coming in, let's say it's a developer first product. So the developer comes in, is using the product. Now, in some cases, maybe the developer is actually putting down a credit card, but many times they're actually just using the freemium version, right? Uh, and then you have this concept of, you know, who's the economic buyer, who's the decision maker, um, uh, and then who's kind of the influencer to, to, to get all of that engine just cranking. And so can you talk through a little bit of that process? How do you get... How do you go from an individual developer who loves your product and probably can actually influence the buying decision, right? But then navigating that to getting the buyer to actually say, "Hey, we're going to make this. We're going to pay. We're going to pay, you know, 10k, 20k for this," uh, and, and then go from there. Yeah. Well, I kind of mentioned those kind of three modes 
that I think about, which is, you know, the individual, the team and enterprise, what I sometimes think about as kind of the one, two, three model. And one of the things I've kind of learned along the way is um, you have to think about those as in some ways they're obviously connected, but they're really distinct products with distinct value propositions. The individual almost always, that's a kind of a creation value proposition. You know, creation, think about the difference between like Photoshop, which is an individual product ultimately, and a Figma. What is the value? And I'm, you know, smushing over a lot of important distinctions, but you know, what is so essential to the Figmas of the world? They are team collaboration products. What is GitHub? It is a team collaboration product. There is an individual mode for GitHub, which is me discovering, you know, open source library to use. That's a creation value proposition versus a team mode which is a uh, collaboration value proposition, right? Those are very, very different modes uh, and very different value propositions and very different orientations. It's not just, I'm, you know, if GitHub were merely like, this is how I find open source projects and then I click a box and I get better search or something, that wouldn't work, right? Like you're, you're, you're pushing string. It has to be intentional. It has to be a different mode. And then when you kind of graduate to enterprise, uh, typically that's some kind of compliance value proposition. Right, uh, uh, either compliance with their processes or compliance in the kind of strict sense of you know regulatory compliance. So, um, I, in an ideal mode, I like to having I like to think about having kind of lead PMs kind of associated with each of those, almost kind of GMs for those things as discrete things. Absolutely, you are modeling and um, uh, creating paths to kind of migrate through, and that's really important as well. Um, but the idea that it's almost fun. Like I get a lot of questions about packaging and pricing and I'm like, it always starts with product value. Like, it's not like, here's a bunch of features. How do we price them? It's sometimes I had a startup that I work with that, you know, it was pretty early and they called in like this fancy pricing consulting firm. I'm like, we're not trying to optimize the price of a gallon of milk. You know, this is fundamental kind of value creation. It's not, the question isn't the price. The question is the value. So that's a product question. Um, so, uh, uh, Again, a short answer to uh, a very long question, but um, uh, hopefully uh, provides uh, some insight how I think about those things. Absolutely, I mean that it's it's such a hard question to answer in a short period of time, but you, you did an excellent job. Um, we so now shifting to some of the audience's questions. Um, this this one actually, I think I know your answer, but um, how early is it too early to start thinking about uh, uh, go to market in in product development? So so basically, how early should someone be thinking about? It? Um, it should be an intrinsic and integral part of your thinking, right? That when you think about creating something, you, you, if you're not thinking about how people are going to kind of discover or experiencing it, you haven't thought fully about what it is. Like, you know, these are not separate or disconnected things. I'm not saying you have to go understand, you know, what your comp model is for the Northeast for a sales region, but um, if you, you know, great products, are ones that are uh, uh, the 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 distribution is uh, or, or is in the go to market is kind of intrinsic. So um, I, I don't want to kind of scare people into thinking they have to get everything right. The same way you don't have to get your UI perfectly right, but it has to be um, intrinsic and intentional in the process, um, at least within you know some realm of of, of, of defined range. Yeah, I, I think uh, what we've seen from the best companies is and, and the best founders is they, they think about it from day one uh, and it is an ingrained part of product development because product ties to go to market and go to market ties to product. So it's, it's a very closely cut couple thing. Um, I, I think uh, next question is um, actually kind of more on, on the personal side. Um, do you have a failure in your career that stands out as particularly valuable to you from the learnings that, that you got from that that uh, you would you would be willing to share with, uh, with the group here? Where do I start? How much time do you have? Um, one of the things I've I've thought a lot about in reflecting my career is kind of when to stay and when to leave. Um, I think I stayed at Personify too long. I think I was I was pushing that 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 string probably past its utility um, and past where I was kind of getting meaningful learning from. Um, uh, 
So that's certainly one. Um, and maybe there's some places. And then again, you know, uh, I was at a company in between personifying Salesforce Corp called Grand Central, and it wasn't working out. And I, you know, um, uh, you know, was all effectively kind of shown the door. And man, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. So uh, uh, I wouldn't have gone to Salesforce if that weren't the case. So kind of staying and leaving, um, those are those tend to be uh, a little tricky. Um, maybe this is less personal, but just maybe more kind of like uh, from an outlook point of view. Um, I have, I think it's true for a lot of people, I have consistently um, underestimated how big things get. And, uh, you know, I would have never in a million years dreamed that Salesforce would be as large as it is. Even starting Cloud Connect in 2011, if you told me that this kind of part of the integration, data integration space was going to be as big as it is, I would have thought about things completely differently. You know, I'm, I'm kind of, on one hand, I'm an entrepreneur and like you have to be forward facing. On the other hand, I'm pretty skeptical. Like I couldn't be more anti-crypto. You know, I live, we all kind of, you know, I'm, I'm, I hope I'm pretty anti-bullshit and I kind of reject a lot of the bullshit out there. And I think that maybe has um, uh, made me at times unhelpfully cynical, but man, if I have learned anything over the years, it's like even tiny spaces, like just the inflation of our broader tech universe, the expansion of our broader tech universe, there is so much opportunity out there. There is so, even I look back 10 years, I'm like, if you told me Twilio would be as big as it is and GitHub would be as big as our Heroku would be, I'm like, I would have thought you were nuts. Like, uh, so um, there's, there's so much opportunity out there. Uh, I really do believe that. Um, and uh, I need to fight my own cynicism occasionally. Uh, so, well, you heard it here for, first. Adam's not a fan of Dogecoin. <laughs> but uh, I, I think uh, one, of the, one of the things that resonates with me there is, you know, as some of the, the, uh, the founders who are in this audience and the future founders, you know, I think when you start your company uh, and you start building a product, it will be very narrow in scope. Um, and it will usually be also uh, uh, you know, a pretty defined user that's actually using the product. Um, and it may seem so weird to you that there's so much potential for this product and for the market, but then all that it's resonating with is this 10 users that, you, that live in your product every single day, right? But that's actually the beginning of these large markets. Um, and and it, it's what's so exciting about it. So, um, you know. Personify was a uh, web analytics company in 1996. Think about the generations and gener and like, you know, by 99, things were looking pretty great. 2000, things were looking pretty great, right? We're like, oh, this, this market's kind of, who knows? How many trillions of dollars of market value has been created in that space since then? Every day we get new companies in that space. At the time I was like, oh, well, this is kind of a solved problem. You know, where, you know, where's the opportunity? What was I thinking? You know, we could list 50 companies now that have been started in the past three years in that space. So um, uh, remain, keeping that conviction alive is hard, um, but uh, in the fullness of time, um, uh, it tends to pan out. Yeah, this is a, a great question that I'm, I'm excited to hear your, your uh, response on. So um, would you agree, agree that to, uh, to do product-led growth, you have to start with a product-led growth model? So if you start with a different model, uh, do you think that you can go back to a, uh, a product-led growth model in the future? Um, there are companies that are certainly making the transition from traditional enterprise to kind of more full PLG. And it's usually part of a transition um, from being an on-prem company to being a cloud company. And because if you're not making that like transition, the two right go hand in hand to the larger point of these things tend to be, tend to be linked. Um, it's harder to go start being an enterprise company to go down to PLG than, or, uh, than it is to kind of just start with individual and, and go to enterprise. They're both kind of hard directions. Um, it's obviously harder when there's just more stuff in place. If you have a real uh, intentionality around it and the right leadership commitment to it, um, any kind of transformation is possible, um, but it ain't easy. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> I think that is a, it's, it's, a tough, it's, it's a tough way to go back, but I think the point that you mentioned about um, on-prem versus cloud, that is something that we see particularly with open source companies, uh, developer first open source companies go through that a lot. 
Um, what what is also interesting though is is I think, and this is Adam, I'd be curious on your thoughts. Is you know I think when we say product led growth, we do immediately mean um, kind of a provider hosted. The way we think about cloud is kind of provider hosted. But you can also have self managed product led growth as well, right? Which could be something that um, uh, it's just the, the motion at which they're uh, they're you know, adopting this product and, and the, uh, the sales cycles and stuff are still short enough to be part of that. Would you agree with that, Adam, or do you, do you kind of do, you do delineate between those two? There are some companies that I'm an investor in that have on-prem products. You know, it's kind of part and parcel of the on, uh, open source world. Um, but uh, as much as I'm anti-crypto, I'm pro-cloud, even more, right? I, I just don't think there's any future in anything on-prem, full stop. Uh, I, I, even the definition of what on-prem means is changing. I've been doing cloud now for over 20 years. Um, there is no future in on-prem, full stop. I, I just can't, yeah, you can find niches and you can do things and whatever, but um, uh, all of the, the value, uh, the models, the go-to-market models, the customer engagement models, the uh, it's, it's, yeah, no future, full stop. Um. I think uh, finally, I think we'll, we'll try and wrap this up with a question just for uh, for kind of the, all the, the potential founders and, and current founders that are out there that are listening to this. Um, you know, I guess we, we talked a lot about go to market. We talked a lot about culture. Um, what, what are the learnings that you would suggest for, for founders who are uh, starting out to kind of think about these two areas? Like, um, how do I how do I get the right culture in my uh, in my startup um, or my organization? And then also, how do I kind of map that to my, my go to market? Yeah, I guess I would say, you know, number one, don't panic. And number two, um, the same instincts that a lot of founders have, especially as kind of product oriented founders, right? It's very experience focused, it's very value focused, it's very design focused. And I wouldn't say you have to like go pick up a bunch of skills or ideas you don't have. I would just say kind of expand the scope and kind of horizon and empathy for what's already motivating you and driving you. So instead of kind of thinking about the product beginning after somebody clicks the login button, think about the product just beginning the first time somebody hears about your product or solution, however that is, and just design from all the way out. And that will at least give you kind of that broader orientation and that broader empathy and intentionality and like all your product design decisions, you'll get some wrong and that's okay. Um, but just kind of have as wide an aperture as possible, think holistically as possible. And that will kind of, I think, help set you on the right course to have that kind of broader frame that, that leads to PLG success. And just incredible insights. Uh, thank you so much, Adam, for, for all that you uh, shared and for your time today.